Well, good morning. That was pretty high at the end. That was like a more. <laughs> like that kind of came out with this little But it's okay because I'm, this morning I want us to go back, kind of like way back to when my voice did that often. When I was in junior high in the early 90s, during the early 90s, again, some of you are way too young, you don't remember that at all. But for those of us who can remember back to the early 90s, remember the neon? Do you remember the soft, smooth, sweet sounds of DC Talk and various other bands? Well, I remember during that particular era, I kind of started exploring contemporary Christian music, all these different bands. It was really interesting for me. God really met me in that experience. As I began to explore these bands and figure these things out, I found that God was speaking to me about things he wanted to do in my life, ways he wanted to shape and change. It was a really meaningful space for me and for a number of my peers around me. And it was going really, really well. But then it got a bit squashed. Some other people in the church uh, who were in positions of leadership, people I really respected, came to us and said, you really shouldn't be listening to this kind of music because drums are the devil's music and you're opening yourself up to all kinds of darkness, all kinds of evil if you're listening to this kind of music. I remember that like strange mixture of feelings that everyone has in those particular kinds of moments where you're just not quite sure how to feel. Again, there's the temptation to feel offended and frustrated. There's the, the sense of shame. There's the feeling of discouragement, the sense of how could I not figure this out? You know, I've been a Christian for so long, how could I not understand that this, was this God, was this not God? What's going on in this particular space? Again, confusion around the fact these are people I love, these are people I respect, these are people I'm following in all kinds of other spaces of life, and I think they're maybe wrong. And how do I work this thing through? And have you ever had an experience like that? Where you're just kind of cruising along and God's doing something significant in your life and then someone comes that's just a bit critical, someone comes that has a really strong push and argument against it, it just squashes a bit of the movement of the Spirit of God in your life. And again, I want to be, you know, clear. Again, I was obviously able to work this thing through and process it out and feel comfortable. You know, I wasn't sitting there thinking that Paul was somehow leading us into unhealthy places this morning when he was playing the drums. Again, I was able to process it and work it out, but I also recognized not every one of my peers was able to work this out well. And I really want to be fair. Again, I know in the hearts and minds of the people who approached us, they were doing out of the very best intentions they possibly could. They wanted to shield us, they wanted to protect us, they wanted to help us make good life choices. They were doing the best they could with the information that they knew and how they understood things in those moments. But the things that they said to us were still not true. And the things that they said to us were still damaging over the course of time. It was coming from a legalistic place of fear. And as you know, as a congregation, we're working through the book of Colossians together. This beautiful expression, this beautiful vision of who Jesus is and the life that we get to journey with him on. Paul's explaining to the Colossian church and to us, this is who Jesus is. Why would you ever want anything else? And if you remember last week, he was challenging them not to give in to the hollow and deceptive philosophy of their time, not to buy into this idea that they should engage again with the elemental spiritual forces or with particular parts of the Jewish law, believing that this would make them whole. He's encouraging them, stick true to Jesus and what you know in him. And today we want to pick it up where we left off last week in Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 16. We're going to finish through to the end of chapter 2 together today. Feel free to pull out your Bible or Bible app. There's a QR code coming up on the screen. Uh, any moment, you can click on that as well. It will take you to the passage and to questions for uh, individual or life group study as well. It wasn't working a few hours ago, and I haven't heard yet if it's working or not, but um, you could try it out. If you get a black screen, um, we're just having technical problems, and you could try again later on in the week on our website or um, on the Church Center app. We'll take you to the questions as well. And in the section we're going to look at today, the Apostle Paul is challenging the church to resist an unhealthy legalism and to fiercely protect the freedom that they have in Christ. And so let's pray together before we dive in. Our God and Father, we thank you that you have invited us into a life of wholeness and abundance and goodness and freedom in your presence. That everything you call us to is always good. It is always true and it is always right. We ask, Holy Spirit, in these moments that you would penetrate to the deep places of our souls, that where we need it, you would set us free. Where we need to be encouraged, that you would strengthen us. Where we just need the affirmation of your presence, that you would bless us with that. Would you guard and shield and protect us from any way that darkness may want to distort our time this morning and just grant us the capacity to walk faithfully with you. We thank you for the good gift of your love and your word and your presence. Holy Spirit, would you accomplish all that you desire in these moments? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, Paul has just been challenging them. Don't give in to the hollow and decept deceptive philosophy of your time. And then he continues with these words. 
Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And in this particular part of the passage, the Apostle Paul is challenging the people, don't give in to the lie that keeping parts of the Jewish law will bring you into relationship with God. What was going on in their culture and in that space is some people around them were saying, certainly if you follow the food laws or else some kind of really restricted diet, and if you're really intentional about the new moon celebrations and a strict kind of keeping of the Sabbath day, these things are essential and necessary to please God and find relationship with him. And again, this is kind of the heart of legalism. Legalism at its core will say you need to follow the rules in order to be acceptable to God. And it is your ability to follow the rules that makes you acceptable to God. And often legalism starts out with the very best intentions possible. Say, for example, if I were to refrain from some particular activity and it was really meaningful for me and it helped me get to know God more, that would be a really good thing. But if I then decided that every single person should never, ever be able to practice that particular thing, that no, everyone should be forbidden from it in order that they would know God in the same way, I'm moving into an unhealthy legalism. And legalism often grows and develops and moves forward until there's more and more and more rules and becomes more and more complicated to try and figure out what we're supposed to do. And at its very heart, things begin to shift. So the ultimate goal ceases to be really knowing God and flourishing in life with him, and it simply becomes about just following the rules. A really good example of this we see played out with Jesus and the Pharisees. Again, the Pharisees coming out of the Israelites' exile, they've been, they, the people of Israel had sinned, they were sent off into exile, and when they came back, a group of them said, we will never let this happen again. We will never again become a group of people who sin against God and he has to send us off into exile. The very best motives in the world. But what they did with that was they took the law that God had given to them and they built a fence the whole way around it. And said, if this is the law, we want to be about here. Because we want to make sure that nobody ever gets close to breaking the law. And out of the very best motives possible, they built a structure of ongoing more and more and more rules and more laws and more structure until they were losing the point. And when we see Jesus interacting with the Pharisees centuries later, he's constantly challenging them that what they're doing is not right, that in these human rules that they have built, they're actually keeping people from knowing God and the abundance and the fullness of who he is. He's warning them that this legalistic structure is damaging and destructive. And centuries before, the prophet Isaiah had said these words, the people come near me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. And here Paul is challenging this idea. He's saying the law was never meant in and of itself to be the ultimate end. It is a shadow of the glory and the goodness of the things to come, the fullness of the revelation that they would see in Jesus. And now for those who've received Christ and are walking with him, there's this profound sense of freedom. Freedom from the food regulations and freedom from a really strict observance of the new moon festivals and Sabbath days and all these other things that they felt that they needed to do. And this thought is echoed by the author of the Hebrews, who encourages the people that are reading his letter to remind them that because Jesus has delivered already the perfect sacrifice, there's now no more need for animal sacrifices and for the people of God to continuously be offering these things because we are free from this. Jesus has utterly fulfilled the law. And so in Jesus, we have also been brought to fullness. And so there is this capacity for freedom and an ability to decide what is best for us and how we interact with food and with Sabbath days and with festivals and with all these different kinds of things. There's a beautiful freedom in Jesus. But part of what's really challenging about legalism is it feels very attractive. And first of all, it feels really attractive because it looks really clear. We just need to make sure we never, ever do any of these things, and that we always do all of these things. And if we do that, somehow it will make us acceptable to God. Well, we know what we're supposed to do. But the further in we get, the more complex it becomes. And the more we recognize our inability and our lack of capacity to faithfully live out everything that we think that we're supposed to do and to be. And legalism also plays into a part of our brokenness. You see, every single one of us recognizes the ways that we have failed, the ways that we have sinned, the brokenness, the damage, the lack of wholeness in our souls. 
We know these things really well. And legalism presents to us, it meets us in that place of shame and says, if you just do enough, you can again be acceptable to God. If you work hard enough, if you try enough, if you do all these things, if you're just right enough, God would draw you back in. And it's appealing because on some level we recognize we need to do something. We need to find some way to get close. We feel an effort that we need to somehow earn closeness with God all over again. And legalism meets us in that. And we also find legalism attractive because it's comparative by nature. We are constantly comparing ourselves to those around us. Am I doing better or worse than the people around me? Certainly I'm okay because I'm not nearly as sinful as the people that sit in that section over there. Sorry. Um, you know, or else if we're looking at other people saying we're not nearly as bad as them, it puffs us up and gives us a sense of superiority and pride. But then if we look at the good people over there, we say maybe I'm not nearly as good as they are. And we begin to be filled with shame. And legalism draws us through these cycles of pride and superiority and shame and fear and anxiety that leads us into all kinds of unhealthy places. And there are remarkable challenges with how it plays out because it misses the essential truth that none of us could ever do enough to earn our place with God. We were reminded last week that we were dead in our sins. We were utterly dead and then we could not save ourselves. No matter how hard we tried or what we did or what we tried to accomplish, our goodness would never be holy enough. It would never be righteous enough. We could never make up for all the darkness and the wickedness in our past, even if we were perfect from this moment on. We needed a savior because our efforts are just not enough. And what Jesus did is in his death, he took on all of the weight of my sin and your sin. And he carried it on himself so that if we receive Christ, he takes the weight of all of our evils. And we are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. And as we are clothed with his righteousness, that is what makes us acceptable to God. Not all of our effort, not all of our attempts to earn it. We get to have a relationship with God based not on our performance, but based on the fact that Jesus has already done absolutely everything that is necessary for us to come to God. We get to receive salvation as a really good gift of God's grace, of his unmerited favor towards us. We could never earn it. And we don't need to try. And legalism misses this point. It stifles our capacity to receive the really good gift of God's grace because it convinces us that we need to tr somehow work hard enough to try enough, to accomplish enough in order to be successful or seen in God's sight. And it raises within us this prideful sense of self-sufficiency. The author F.F. F. Bruce commented that a proud spirit of self-sufficiency is the heart of rebellion against God. And we see this from the very first sin with Adam and Eve in the garden all the way through. Adam and Eve simply said, we want to rule our own lives. We want to be self-sufficient, knowing good and evil. We want all the insight and knowledge we can possibly attain. We want our own way and our own life. And ever since that moment, every single one of us has said exactly the same thing. We want to be self-sufficient. We want to be able to earn our own sense of righteousness. We want to be able to accomplish these things on our own. And it blinds us to our need for a savior. Again, in about 20 years of ministry, I think one of the most terrifying conversations that I ever had was with a really, really good young man who'd grown up in the church. He was amazing. He did so many really, really good things. And we were in a Bible study one evening, and we were talking about the need to be gracious with one another because God has extended to us so much grace and forgiveness. We also should be gracious with the people around us. And I'll never forget it. He looked straight at me and said, it's my righteousness. I have worked really hard for it, and it is mine. And in that moment and ever since, I have been so afraid for his soul. Because the thing is that all these really good things that he was doing were blinding him to the truth that he just needed a savior. He believed that he had worked hard enough, had accomplished enough, had been right enough in order for God to accept him. But on the day of judgment, our own righteousness will never be enough. All the goodness that we could possibly sum up will never be enough to accomplish salvation for us. We are just desperately in need of Christ. But legalism can poison us all of the way through, thinking that if we just do enough and accomplish enough, we could be good enough to earn our place with Jesus. 
And so Paul warns the Colossians, this is destructive and damaging and dangerous. And maybe for some of us, this is also exactly what we need to hear. Because maybe not all of the way, but maybe to some extent, we have even a subtle belief that it is our goodness, it is our accomplishments, it's our goals, it's our own righteousness, our ability to keep the rules that makes us whole and acceptable to God. When the truth of the matter is, every one of us lives every moment of our lives in desperate need of a Savior. And then the Apostle Paul goes on to say, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen, and they are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. And in this section of the passage, he's challenging us with what we talked about last week. Don't ever give in to the worship of angels or the worship of any other spiritual entity or being because that what you have in Jesus is so superior to all of this. He has brought you to fullness and no matter what kinds of great stories others may have of their spiritual experiences apart from Christ, if it doesn't lead you to Jesus, you don't want anything to do with it. And then he comes back to his previous argument and says, Since you died with Christ, the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do with things that that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. And again, Paul comes back to this point, that legalism is unhealthy and it's not whole. When we received Jesus and when we went through that picture of baptism and died with him, we died to the old way of life of trying to earn our place with God, and we were raised to a new way of life based wholly and fully on what Jesus has already accomplished for each and every one of us. And Paul points out that there may be people who look really righteous, people who seem really able and willing to follow all of the rules of their religious experience, and everyone around them thinks that they're fantastic. But inside, they may still be consumed with evil. And again, this is possible for us as well. It's possible to be here today or joining us online, and everything looks great. It's possible to be here today and look cleaned up and ready for church, presentable and ready to go. But maybe on the inside, there's all kinds of evil that we just can't restrain. And the problem with legalism is that it creates this false facade. We are terrified in legalism that anybody might ever find out that we are struggling or caught in sin or trying to work through something because we feel like if anyone ever really knew us, we would be pulled off of the pedestal we have worked so hard to get towards. Because when we believe it's about our own effort, we are unwilling to acknowledge and admit the reality of the brokenness and the weakness that we have. And so often we live hiding away in all kinds of paralyzing shame because we're so frightened that someone might see us or know us as we truly are. But the flip side of this is even more dangerous and even more destructive. Because if you believe that your capacity to get close to God was based on your effort, on your accomplishment, on your earning the space with God, if you were able to accomplish it, it would produce within you the most terrifying kind of pride, the most stifling kind of superiority towards the people around you. It would cripple your capacity to really know God and walk with him in meaningful ways. The author C.S. Lewis commented that pride is the utmost evil. And all other evils pour out of a space of pride. It is the complete anti-God set of mind. This idea that I am simply superior. Lewis went on to say that pride is so evil that the devil is perfectly content to see you become chaste and brave and self-controlled, provided all the time he is setting up in you the dictatorship of pride. It is a spiritual cancer that eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even common sense. And this coming from someone who lost his wife to cancer. Again, Lewis and Paul would remind us that the terrifying reality of a legalistic spiritual pride is it stifles life right out of us. 
It creates within us an inability to admit our weaknesses or our faults or our needs or the fact that we're desperately in need of Christ. When you are caught in this, you will do anything possible to look as good as is humanly possible, or you will look down on everybody else and not even recognize your pride as a particular part of your sin. And when we live particularly in spiritual pride, it locks us increasingly in smaller and smaller and smaller cages where we become incapable of relating meaningfully to God or to the people around us or receiving forgiveness or challenge or correction because we are so afraid to lose our sense of our own righteousness. And so we are warned that this is deadly and that this is dangerous, but it can be absolutely everywhere. And spiritual pride can corrupt the very best kinds of actions and attitudes and people. Again, it doesn't take very long to find it. A quick scroll through YouTube will very quickly reveal to you someone who's taking some aspect of the Christian faith, which is usually secondary at best, and they're out there railing passionately against anyone and everyone who believes something even slightly different than they are with no grace, with no humility, and with no capacity for change. And it's possible that we could come into a place like this this morning, and even subtly, a sense of spiritual pride begins to creep in. We might look around at the people around us and just think, even subtly, I think I'm better than they are. Because the things that I know, or the journey that I've had with Jesus, or what I want, or the way that I worship, it can take a beautiful moment like this and corrupt it. So that we're not really worshiping Jesus at all in those moments. We're just thinking about ourselves and how much better and how much superior we are to the people around us. And it can take even our very best moments and actions and distort and twist them into something vile and damaging. It's hard and cold and difficult. And some of us know all about this because we've come from backgrounds where legalism was just rampant and all over the place. We came from cultures and environments where there was such a harsh and strict list of rules that we had to follow all of the time. Or there were these dominating religious figures that demanded a full and utter obedience. And it left us feeling ashamed and afraid and the need to protect ourselves and hide any element of struggle. Again, I remember uh, recognizing early-ish in my ministry that uh, if there are people in my congregation from a particular Mennonite background, I needed to be really careful not to contact them on a Thursday. Because if I was calling them on a Thursday, they thought that I was calling them to shun them, to kick them out of the church. And I didn't even know what shunning was. I had no idea. But they said to me, you have to stop calling us on Thursday. You're freaking us out. And I was like, I don't even know what's going on. Can you, can you explain this to me? Can you help me understand what's happening? And again, maybe that's been a bit of our experience. Maybe we have grown up in a culture or a space or a mindset where others around us have pushed on us that it is our capacity to do things well that makes us acceptable to God. But this is not as it is intended to be. The Apostle Paul reminds us, in Christ is the fullness of all that we need. He is the one who saves us through his sacrifice. It is the very Holy Spirit of God that even gives us the desire for him. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us the capacity to follow God and to be obedient in all things. He gives us abundantly in everything that we need to journey with him. As, un- as, as unfaithful as we may be in the journey. It all is Jesus, from first to last, all the way through. Now, I want to be really careful with this. I want to be clear so that this doesn't get shifted or distorted in any way. I do believe that we are called to obey Jesus in everything that he invites us into. I believe that we are called to obey the scripture. I even believe that there are spaces where we need healthy and right church discipline. But we need to approach this from the standpoint of recognizing that what we have in Jesus is all that we need. And we desire to pursue holiness and rightness and goodness and truth in response to the acceptance that we have have in Jesus, not as a way to earn our place with Jesus. And we can and we should have conversations with one another about areas that we're concerned about in each other's lives, but we should do this with grace. We should do this with humility. We should do this with a desire for what is best, not with a sense of superiority and a desire to prove that we are right over and above somebody else. We should process these things graciously. And at their utmost extreme, where there's experiences that require church discipline, we should do this in a way that leads to and seeks restoration and healing and abundance and fullness and fruitfulness. Because it isn't about how well we can follow the rules. 
It's about recognizing that Jesus has done everything that needs to be done for us, and we just choose to submit ourselves to him and receive from him the abundance of all that we need, and then engaging our wills to pursue him and to walk with him, playing our part to pursue holiness in response to what he has already done, not to earn it from him. Because what we have in Jesus is just so good. It's miraculous. It's unlike any other religious experience known to humanity all across the globe. It is profoundly different. Because we have the chance to get close to God and to know him, not based on our effort or our accomplishments, but based on what Jesus has already done. But how do we navigate this through? How do we work it out if we recognize that legalism is playing out in some part of our life or our existence? Again, the first thing we need to do is to be honest with God and to be honest with ourselves. And if we're not sure if we're giving into legalism or if it's a part of our lives, here's a few things that might be helpful hints for us. Again, do you have within you a sense of superiority, particularly spiritual superiority? Do you find yourself looking down on other Christians because of how they practice or what they do or maybe what they don't do? Or maybe even with people who don't yet know Jesus, do you find yourself judgmental and critical of them, thinking of yourself as simply qualitatively better? If these things show up, it reminds us that there's probably an element of legalism playing out in our souls. Also, do you find it difficult to be open and honest with yourself and with God and maybe even with others about the areas of your life where you're caught in sin or brokenness or struggle or where you are not whole? Again, if we find it difficult to be open about these things, probably there's some part of us that feels afraid to acknowledge them because we feel like some element of our relationship with God depends upon them. But freedom isn't found in hiding these things away. It's found in being open and honest with God and with one another. And obviously the clear one is, if you find yourself trusting more in your ability to keep the rules than you do in Jesus' finished work for you, there's probably an element of legalism playing out in your soul. Once we recognize that this is playing out within us, the second most important thing that we need to do is just to go to Jesus and confess this as the sin that it is. Just to go to Jesus and honestly and openly acknowledge this is where we are at. And a part of what I love about confession is in confession, we just agree with Jesus. We just say, yes, Jesus, I recognize that this is here and this is evil. This is not as it ought to be. Would you forgive me? And also along this journey, if we recognize legalism is playing out in our souls, it's also probably pretty critical to confess this to somebody else. Because with these really deep, awful, dark kinds of evil, we can only overcome them with the help and support and strength of those around us. And let's be really honest. There's nothing that's better for my level of spiritual pride than having to confess to someone else what my sins look like. It just helps to bring me down to a healthy and a holy level. And if there's other areas of our lives where we're caught in sensuality or in anything else, an open and honest confession with someone that we know and trust is just the very best choice we can possibly make. Because it heals both our spiritual fear and our spiritual pride like nothing else will. We recognize that we don't need to hide away. But we can be open and honest with ourselves and with God and with those around us. And in that process, pursue and move towards healing. And after we've confessed these things, the third thing that we need to do is just ask, us to fr ask Jesus to free us. Ask him to do within us what we cannot do for ourselves. Because, again, I certainly I know the experience. When I've tried to break the power of legalism within me on my own, I'm really, really bad at it. And I can start to feel arrogant and superior about any possible success that I might even have. We just need Jesus to do this work within us because we are powerless against it. And so we ask him to come and to heal and to free and to restore and to bring us an accurate perspective. And then the fourth thing is what we often want to jump to. But in the fourth thing, we choose to also engage our will and to pursue the work that Jesus is doing within us. Again, maybe this looks like memorizing passages about the dangers of pride or the reality of grace. Maybe this looks like when we see someone and we want to become superior over them to simply say, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would probably do that or something worse. I remember years ago, I worked with a youth pastor who was tremendous at this. Anytime there was some kind of scandal or disaster or someone did something really, really foolish and sinful, he would immediately say to the group that he was with, I know that would be me except for the grace of God. If God hadn't been gracious to me, I would have done that and something so much worse. And it just breaks the feeling of superiority that we have. 
And any time we realize that we have self-righteousness rising to the surface, we just bring it to Jesus and say, Jesus, would you forgive me? We repent of it, we turn away from it, and we move towards him in the abundance of what he offers to us. And the final thing that I think is critical for us to break the power of legalism is an experience of communion. Because in communion, we have this dual beautiful thing where in communion we express and we confess openly and honestly that we cannot save ourselves. We confess that we are desperately in need of a Savior to come and free us and restore us and renew us. And we also confess that Jesus has already done abundantly everything that is necessary to bring us to God. Again, in a few minutes, what we're going to do is we're going to stand. And when we stand, we are publicly saying to the world, seen and unseen, that we are in desperate need of a Savior. That our capacity to keep the rules is simply not enough to bring us into life and relationship with God, that we desperately need him. And then as we come forward, we receive the elements that we could not have if someone else did not give them to us. In a humble acknowledgement that we are powerless apart from Jesus' work in our lives. And then we take within our very selves the bread that represents Jesus' body that was given for us and his blood that was shed so that we could be washed free as an acknowledgement that he is enough. That his sacrifice has washed us clean. That it is only the blood of Jesus that makes us whole as we sang about a few minutes ago. And in communion we have this beautiful expression of our faith and a powerful humble confession of our need and in the glorious sufficiency of our Savior coming together as we experience these moments. But the scriptures would challenge us that we need to take some time to prepare our hearts because we live in a broken world and we are a broken people. And so we need some time to honestly confess to him the sins, whether it's legalism or arrogance or pride or sensuality or whatever it might happen to be. We want to acknowledge these things openly with Jesus and lay them before him so that we are able to receive as much of Jesus as we possibly can. And so let's just take a few moments to prepare our hearts to receive communion.